but I should introduce our final guest to the show. Um, so our final guest is a very exciting final guest. Um, you'll probably recognize our final guest. Um, they are an associate professor at CASA at UCL. Um, and you may have seen them in the theater or in a school or on TV or on radio or in a little picture in the back of a book of hers that you've read or in last year's Royal Institution Christmas lectures. Um, you can probably guess who it is that's coming. Um, let me welcome to the show, Hannah Fry. Hi. Hello. Hey. Scroggs, well, you look remarkably good for a man who has not. Yeah, I look, I actually look better. Back. If I hold something white up, you can see how yellow the wall is. <laughs> And my camera is correcting for that and I can't turn that off. So I'm very red. <laughs> no, you look good. You look good. Yeah. I think I've only gone 35 hours once in my entire life, which is when I had uh, a child. Yes, <laughs> well, look, I've not had I a think child. I was hallucinating. I mean, I was not holding it together. Certainly not talking to an audience on YouTube Live like you are. Yeah, well, this will be fine. This will be fine. <laughs> so have you managed to um, watch any of the show? I, you know what, I just caught a bit of Eugenia Cheng um, there. Uh, I have not because said child is a uh, was insisting on Halloween um, themed games today. So of course, I know well, I have. I'm sure you'll know that it's all on YouTube, so you can catch up whenever you like. Oh, just as anyone else watching who's not seen the whole thing can. What was um, the highlight for you so far, Scroggs? Yeah, so I've written down a few highlights. Um, there was a great highlight at one a.m. when someone called Matthew Scroggs was on the stream. Um, <laughs> Heard of him? Yeah, so he he actually surprise released the new issue of Chalk Dust. Um, live on camera um which was really good fun big moment um, i've got some other highlights but actually i think i've got kind of a joint highlight which was 7 a.m this morning when tom scott and katie steckles are on and also 11 20 last night just after midnight when um tom rocks math was on um because we had two really great moments on camera where we had aha math moments where people mm. live worked out a thing and you got to see their face as they like had <laughs> that really good moment and i really enjoyed both of those bits who was, I want to know who was doing the trick between Tom Scott and Katie Steckles. Um, so Katie was showing Tom how to, you know the thing Katie does where she folds up a piece of paper, cuts it and uh -huh. makes words. Mm -hmm. um, she challenged Tom to make the letter T. And after a lot of confused staring, he managed to cut a letter T from an A4 piece of paper and just explode in an aha moment. And it was really, really wonderful to watch. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm hoping rewinding. Um, we might be able to have a final aha moment um, because you've not brought a trickle on, but I've brought a trickle on for you. And we're going to attempt to let you work out live on the stream how my trick works. This is this is going to be the moment, Scrubs, where where the, the charade that I've been keeping up for a number of decades about um, how capable I am at mathematics all falls apart. So this is going to be the moment, I fear. <laughs> It should, it should be okay. so it's, it's a variation of a of like maybe a trick you've seen maybe a trick you've not seen um can you see four numbers on the screen i can excellent so what i'm going to do under those numbers um so yeah as we've had lots of guests on during the show um and i guess have brought a trick along i thought it was only fair to let you perform a trick so Ooh, while okay. i'm doing this trick um you are going to be telling me exactly what to do um at certain points in the trick so i'm going to start by dealing out some cards Okay, I've dealt out some cards mm -hmm. um, and they should all be visible. Um, and you're going to choose one of those cards to be your card, but don't tell me what it is. Okay. The second to decide which one your card is. Got it. And then you're going to tell me which column one, two, three, or four your card is in. Three. Three. Okay. Now I'm going to flash them down into four piles. Now I'm going to pick up these piles of cards, but because you're the magician for this trick, you're going to tell me which order to pick up the cards. So which pile should I pick up first? Uh, let's go for pile one first. Then. People who are watching this on YouTube, by the way, I'm, I, I fully need you to help me. <laughs> um, okay, so which pile should I pick up next? Uh, let's go four and then two and then three. Okay. Wait, which order are you, are you putting them on the bottom? Which way around? I was around putting them on the bottom, yes. Yeah, so I picked up and then put everything else underneath. So three is currently on the bottom. Three is currently on the bottom, yes. And I'm going to deal the cards out again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do the same thing again. So mm -hmm. once again, you're going to tell me which column it's in, and then we're going to pick them up in your order of your choice. Uh, it's in three again. Okay, so I'm going to flatten the piles. And then I'm going to pick the four piles up. Wait, You're someone's saying that I've done this trick in a number file video. I haven't. I wish I had. <laughs> I wish I had. Okay, let's go. Um, let's go one, two, four, three. 
Okay. Um, okay, so we're doing something a little bit different now. You're going to pick mm. two of the piles I've just dealt. Okay, let me just work out where it is. <laughs> uh, I can't. Um, let's go one and two. One and two. Mm. Okay, I'm going to split the remaining piles and pick two piles again. Uh, let's go one and two again. Okay, and let me split those up again. All right, Daniel, Daniel Hodgkins knows how it works and Daniel, I need you. Uh, let's go one and two again. Am I still two again? Yeah, okay. Okay, and now you're going to pick one final card. Two. Two, okay. So I mind you, I'm very tired. This could well have gone very wrong, but you're the magician, so it's definitely your fault if this has gone wrong. Um, Hannah Fry, what was your card? Five of clubs. You clever man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just relieved it worked. I've, I, I've tested it many times and it's worked about 70% of the time. So I'm glad that I'm very worked. impressed. I'm very impressed. Um, so any ideas what I might have been doing? Okay, so definitely at the end when I pick two, uh, I think, although I wasn't properly paying attention, but my guess is that you, you know where, where the card is already. And so you either take them away or leave them based on what I say. So I think when I say one and two, sometimes you leave one and two and sometimes you take one and two. Okay, so yeah, so in the final part, I'm not actually giving you a choice. Yes, exactly. I'm just taking, yeah, I'm, so that is how the last part works. So, so then, then the first bit, so my, so there's four cards in each pile, is that right? Yes. It's four, yep. And four piles. Yep. So whatever order you pick them up in, uh the, okay so the end of the first round you know which four cards it's in whatever order you pick them up in when you deal them out you know that they're going to be the four cards that were originally in column three for instance are going to be distributed between the four columns okay so I, my guess is my hunch is what order sorry which column it's in initially hmm, will tell you uh wait am i close you're very close yes <laughs> um, okay let me just work it out hang on so mine was in column three you don't know where in those four cards it is but actually there's only one there's only going to be one unique card because you do it twice there's only one unique card which is in both those positions fine Okay, yes, so I'm going to, I'm just quickly dealing it out again in a way that Great, we demonstrate how to work. Um, I'm impressed how quickly you worked it out, um, but I guess that's pretty much all I could be doing because I'm definitely not actually magic. Yeah, although the so last bit did throw me, I'll be honest. The last bit did throw me. Yeah, so you were actually lucky on the last bit where I think it was only one of them did I do something different. Mm. So you almost always picked something where your card was. Yeah. So it clearly was actual magic by luck. <laughs> um, so just to demonstrate to everyone on the call how exactly that happened, um, I've now dealt out the cards, but I've put the same kind of card in each column to kind of yeah. emphasize what's going on. Um, so what happened in the trick was um, Hannah told me which column the card was in. So if she'd said two, I then know her card's one of the kings. And when Hannah got to choose which order I picked them up in, um, it didn't actually matter because I was just remembering what I'd done. So the only difficulty in the trick was for a very, very tired man to remember what I'd been doing <laughs> in what order. And then you'll see when I deal them out again, the columns have now become rows. Yeah, of course. It's like a matrix, right? It's like a matrix transpose, yeah. yeah. Um, so now when you tell me the column, I know exactly which card yours is. <laughs> then you pick them up in some order and it's just remembering how far down the pack your card is and then kind of tricking you into thinking you're having a choice at the end when really there's only one thing that could happen. That's a great trick. Uh, yeah. Alison Clark points out that you are actually magic, which... Um, I think is a fair assessment of the situation. Yeah. <laughs> Good, right, let me go back to actual camera. So um, during lockdown, I uh, I wanted to find little games that I could play, like little, so when I did the Christmas lectures last year, um, a lot of it is about coming up with really active things that you can do with children. Anyway, so I like got into this thing where I started looking at really old books of things that you can play. And I came across one, um, 
that is look I mean I bought it from like a, a oh, second hand wow. bookstore like a really old one I mean these ones are the amazing ones so there's a couple of things I, I'm gonna like, hide my video so you're large so everyone can see this book um there's a couple of things I like about this book first it's written by someone called Tom Tit <laughs> what can I say um but secondly lots of the stuff in here is um just amazingly dangerous so um there is uh, let me see if there was one i found earlier that i was going to show you uh there's one where they they say that it's a good game that you can play with a child hold on hang on hang on hang on hang on i should have turned the page oh no, there is i did i did i was clever okay um yes this is a game that you can play with a child um and how you can make use when you're with a child of a broken bottle with jagged edges what, what? Like... <laughs> no. no what you should do <laughs> what you should do with child is uh, fill what's left of the bottle uh with oil up to a level which falls uh, short of the rough broken part and then when everything is at rest introduce into the oil a red hot poker just taken from the fire <laughs> And then a crack will be heard and you'll find that the bottle has cut cleanly at the level of the liquid, right? This is the sort of games that people used to um, people used to play with their children, which I quite like. Um, for the sake of any children watching, please, please don't try anything that Hannah suggests during this call. Quite fun, isn't it? I also, though, I ended up going on a bit of a, a mad thing about buying loads of really old, old books. So there's this one as well. This is like an old math book. It's called Elementary Algebra. And um, actually, uh, Math Gem on Twitter, uh, she, uh, she does, uh, Jen, what's her surname? I've forgotten her name. Her name. Um, Jo Morgan. She was actually on the call <laughs> yeah, Morgan, earlier yeah. today. She did a trick with um, Sophie McLean earlier. Yeah, she's, she's amazing, right? She's really amazing. And she actually really likes these kind of books because she thinks that the way that they progress the mathematical ideas for students who are learning is like really... Um, uh, much easier to understand than the modern textbooks, which I think is kind of an interesting idea. So I started reading some of these textbooks because um, just because, you know, if Joe says it's good, then it's going to be good. Anyway, this particular one that I found has got some amazing stuff in it. Um, this is an example of one of the type of problems that people used to used to answer. Um, 110 bushels of coal are divided among a number of poor persons. If each had received one bushel more, uh, he'd have received as many bushels as uh, as were persons. The question is, how many poor persons were there? <laughs> it's just the um, the kind of quality question it's, that you could have expected in the past. It's it's <laughs> it's an interesting um, context for a question. Not what I would choose if I was a question setter. No, that's uh, that's what I did in my first lockdown. Um, not sure what I'm going to do in my second. <laughs> yes, because of course that since we've been on this call, that has all kicked mm. off. Um, I still don't really know what's happening because I've just been watching this, which has obviously been more entertaining. I think if you go and watch it now, Scroggs, if I'm honest, you won't be sure what's real and what's imaginary. Given that no, you well, I'm kind of. I, I was tw ten minutes ago. I was chatting to Hannah Fry on IRC. This is a sentence I never thought I would say because it's not 1995 anymore. But anyway, um, it's happening. Um, so yeah, so so you're obviously involved in an awful lot of things. Um, what, what, what's like your next thing? What can we look forward to? My next thing? Um, well, so, um, I am writing a book at the moment, um, which is, I haven't got my elevator pitch down for it, to be honest. Um, so, uh, there's going to be a lot of umming and erring in this sentence, but basically, so I have a Radio 4 show that's with, um, with a geneticist called Adam Rutherford. And uh, the show ended, I mean, it was supposed to just be like people send us in questions and we play, you know, sort of play around with answers, but it ended up being something that people really listen to with their families. So like young kids and their, and you know, their parents introduced them to it. Um, and so uh, it turns out that actually, if you like use that as your guide, there's, there's really fun things you can do. I mean, basically all of the questions that kids ask you that you have no idea how to answer. Um, like for example, we had this one kid who asked us, what is fire? Which actually is quite an insightful question. I mean, if you really get into it, that's actually quite hard. Or another one, my favorite one ever, which was um, what is the tiniest dinosaur? It's actually a very, very interesting question because you've got to decide how you define a dinosaur, right? Um, Anyway, so we decided that we uh, would write a book with that kind of stuff in mind. Like, I think it's a book for everyone, but it's basically um, those really weird 
uh, a, a weird way to look at the world, I guess, the kind of the weird questions that you, that on the surface sound like they're really simple, but actually once you dig a bit deeper, are really insightful. Like for example, does my dog love me, right? There's a chapter in the book about does my dog love me, which actually ends up being incredibly, you know, you go into like really cutting edge science in there. Um, so that's mainly what I'm doing at the moment is finishing writing that um, and teaching at UCL, obviously my favorite. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and then a few other bits and bobs here and there. But yeah. Um, cool. Um, so I have some slightly silly questions to ask you because I run out of good questions. I love good, um, love silly questions. So um, yeah, uh, on the same track as you haven't done lots of things. Um, so all the amazing things you've done, if you were to kind of rank them from the best thing you've done to the worst thing you've done, what would be the median thing? The median thing? The median oh thing, my yeah. God, that's a great question. Oh God, that's a really good question. I mean, I can definitely think of a lot of bad stuff I've done. <laughs> yeah, like being interviewed for Chalk Dust. No, that one was great. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was a pretty good interview. On that was great. Yeah. Um, what uh, what would be the median? Probably, an, uh, actually, maybe that's towards the better end. Um, okay, so I did a programme called Britain's Greatest Invention, which was nothing mathematical at all. So I think everything in the top end is where it's like mathematical. And then everything in the bottom end is like where I have to do something just to keep someone happy. <laughs> um, so let's say the median is, is the, the boundary between those two. Those two. Okay. Um, so when, when you make something for TV, radio, et yeah. cetera, how much is it up to you what it's about and how much is it kind of imposed on you? So my motto is uh, one for them, one for me. <laughs> um, and I think that if it starts to get not like that, uh, if it starts to get more for them um, rather than for me, then I think I will step away from it. I think that um, there are sometimes projects where I think they're really uh, important and I think that they have like a really good goal. But I also think that actually um, it's not really why I wanted to get into TV. So um, to give you an example, um, I'm trying to think of an example that won't get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to give you an example, I did this program um, about 18 months ago that was called The Honest Supermarket. Now, the idea behind this program is that actually an awful lot of the information that we're given about our food is really covering up some really deeply problematic issues. So issues around climate change, issues around sustainability, issues around animal welfare, um, you know, even issues around like how old the fish is that we're eating, like it's pretty grim actually, but it's sort of all packaged up nicely and kind of given to you. And I think that, that actually there's something very important in that and, and actually quite a scientific point as well about, you know, um, food security and our future on the planet and all of this stuff. So I think like, you know, at, coming from it from an academic perspective, I think there's something really earnest in there. But ultimately, it was just the way that they do it for TV is they built this this rubbish supermarket where all the labels were honest. And it's just a bit like, oh. You know, I, I mean, it did really well. Like it was one of the most watched programs um, of, uh, you know, of science on BBC for like ages. So, you know, I think, and I think everyone was really happy with it, you know, and like it got good reviews and all of that. But I was also like, I don't know whether, you know, I'm a mathematician, right? Like I want to be a mathematician. And those are the things that I find most interesting. And so I think whenever the stuff that I do strays from that too much, um, I think that that is when uh, I like it less. That's a good answer. Um, <laughs> so a question I've just seen coming on chat, um, which is something I not thought of, but it's a good thing to ask you. Um, so I remember a few years ago, you did a program about a pandemic. Um, was this all your fault? Was it your prediction? D didn't you even predict the town it started or something by chance? That was, that was really freaky, actually. That was really freaky that we got, um, yeah. So the first domestic transmission and then... Um, uh, in the UK uh, was the same place that we saw. So, okay, so just, but in case anyone hasn't heard of this already, so what we did is, this is back in 2017, 2018, and um, we ran this big uh, sort of citizen science experiment, big social experiment across the entire country. So the idea was that you could download a smartphone app, and if you had the app on your phone, you could play this game with us where we would look at what would happen if a pandemic hit the UK and uh, you know swept through the entire nation. So partly it was, this is a very interesting idea. I mean, 
epidemiology is just an inherently interesting subject and um, the stunt was kind of good for TV audiences. But really the main motivation, the main reason why we wanted to do this whole thing is that um, we knew that one of these was coming. I mean, this has been on the cards for a long time. Every, I mean, experts have been shouting from the rooftops about this for a number of years. And um, the thing is, despite everyone having mobile phones, despite like this amazing world of data that we live in, the people who mattered, the epidemiologists, basically had no idea about how many people we come into contact with on a daily basis or how far we travel. Like that information is completely separate. Um, you know, mobile phone companies have it, but they don't give it to the epidemiologists or, you know, whatever. So the best data that they have up until the point that we did that study, that the program was a um, was was a paper survey that was done 15 years ago where they asked a thousand people in Britain. Oh, how many people do you reckon you came into contact with this week? Right. That was the best data that we had. up to that Seems point. like pretty unreliable data. I mean, it's not great. Is it? It's not great. Anyway, so during this whole um, TV program, we had 100,000 people who let us trace them for 24 hours. So that was kind of the deal, right? You play the game and you give us your data. Um, so now actually all of the government models have been based on the data that we collected during that TV program. Um, so make of that what you will. I mean, I think the models have been good. Maybe not the decisions made off the back yeah, of them. But it must be great to have kind of been involved in improving the response to this. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. I mean, inevitably, like, as time has worn on, that data, which was a snapshot of the world and how it used to be rather than how it is now. So inevitably, over time, you know, there have been, like, there been other things that have come through. But, yeah, of course, I mean, it's, yeah, you can't help but feel very proud that something that you've been involved in made a massive difference. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I think we have time for one final question. Um, just because if we go past 12 hours on the stream, YouTube just deletes the video. Um, so there's a lot of danger involved at the end of the stream. So it's very yeah, exciting. I keep it short. Um, keep it short. But no, well, we're leaving time for like a team thing at the end. So we can always delete that if we, <laughs> we just have to stop mid-sentence if we get to the time limit. Um, so there's a lot of people on this call who do kind of mass outreachy things or are interested in mass outreachy things. Um, what would your advice be to someone kind of starting out and doing outreachy or public engagement stuff to kind of get that going um okay advice right lots uh but the short answers are i think number one is that whenever you speak to the public or whenever you speak to someone who's not in your field then the number one priority has to be your, what your audience wants not what you want so I think the very best public speakers, the very best communicators are the ones who work out what their audience knows, work out how to excite them and engage them. And then once they've got them, once they've got them excited and enthused and, you know, sort of sitting in the palm of their hand, that is the point at which they deliver the message that they want to get across. Um, so I think that that's incredibly important. Start with your audience. Um, but I also think that uh, practice is the other thing, really. I mean, I think that this is something, you know, I think all of us who've been doing this for a while know that this is a, a genuine craft that takes years to learn. Um, and I still think that I'm still have a long way to go in learning it. Um, and yeah, I think really practice does make perfect. Yeah, that's good advice. Um... So, um, Hannah Vite, it's been really great chatting to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I feel very honoured to be al allowed to be at the end. Thank you very much, Gods. Yeah, well, you're obviously the headline act. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see you in six months when we feel like doing this again. Sure. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Yeah.